Okay, so before uh, today's seminar, first I want to make an announcement that is we will take the take break for next weeks. So next week we have the Ontario Communitarics workshop. So we decide to take a break after that, and then the week after that is the Victoria days. So I will see you guys. And like after this today's talk, I will see you guys like after two weeks. So. Uh, everyone, we will come back to this week's algebraic graph theory seminar. And this week, we have Peter to tell us about the polynomials, ranks, and caps S. Uh, thank you very much, and um, I thank you for the invitation. Uh, so it was mentioned to me that uh, I should probably talk about this topic since uh, there could be applications uh, in the area of uh, algebraic graph theory. Uh, what I can do is to talk about uh, the method and the results, and then it will be for you to decide whether uh, something from this uh, could be useful in your um, area or, or not. Uh, so I, the, this, this method uh, is a new variant of uh, that, that I will talk about is a new variant of the uh, polynomial method, which was first used to give bounds on the size of uh, so-called cap sets. And although polynomials indeed um, arise uh, in, um, in the technique, um, in fact, uh, it's a new notion of, of tensor rank, uh, which uh, plays an important role. So let's let me start uh, with uh, giving the definition of caps or cap sets. Uh, so a cap is a set, uh, um, some geometry uh, in which uh, we cannot find three collinear points. Uh, for instance, uh, it can look like this if it intersect. Uh, such a set by a line, then there can be at most um, two intersections. But uh, we will be interested in the finite uh, setting, uh, especially uh, in the case when uh, we would like to give upper bounds on the size of caps in, uh, in F3 to the N. Uh, why F3 to the N? Uh, because here, in this case, the property that uh, there are no three points on one line uh, has many nice reformulations. Uh, in fact, here, uh, each F fine line contains uh, exactly three points. Uh, so the property that we don't have three points in a line just means that uh, the set is line three. Uh, also, in F3, minus two uh, is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in fact, uh, since we are over F3, um, an F fine line is nothing else but a three term arithmetic progression. Uh, so a cap is just uh, a set which do not contain any three term arithmetic progressions. Uh, I mean, non constant arithmetic progression. And uh, since uh, in F3, uh, minus two is the same as, uh, as one, uh, being an arithmetic progression uh, means that uh, the sum of the three elements is equal to zero. Uh, so um, a cap is in fact a, a zero three sum free set. Uh, uh, zero sum free sets uh, are, are also uh, best studied in additive combinatorics. Um, and or just to give a final reformulation, if we have a cap, then uh, its complement satisfies that it, it uh, intersects, intersects every line. So the complement of the set is a so-called one blocking set. Uh, so some of these uh, questions uh, were in, in the interest of, uh, of finite geometers. In fact, uh, finite geometers call uh, these sets caps. Uh, but uh, since the cap is just a 3 ap three set in F3 to the N, uh, it, it is clear that from the additive combinatorial point of view, this is also an interesting question. And uh, at the blog post of Tao, he, he wrote cap sets. And because of this, uh, both variants, caps, cap sets uh, are used, but uh, uh, these should mean the same. Uh, so the so-called cap set problem asks, asks for the largest possible size of a cap in F3 to the N. Uh, as I had mentioned, it is uh, motivated by finite geometry, uh, for instance. But uh, studying uh, this problem uh, in F3 to the N, that there is no three-term arithmetic progression, 
uh, is in fact a, a model case uh, for bounding the possible size of subsets of say one to n, uh, avoiding street and arithmetic progressions. Uh, if a certain method works in F3 to the n, then it might be the case uh, that it also works in the int integer setting. There is no guarantee, uh, but uh, uh, in case of some of the models, uh, it might be easier to, uh, to work out the details uh, in F3 to the n, um, and then uh, move it to the integer setting. Uh, there are some connections with the matrix multiplication, uh, and it was uh, expected that the solution of, of this problem uh, might lead to the solution of, uh, of other related questions. Uh, I just briefly mentioned the, some, some results from the integer setting. Uh, so it started with the result of Rose, who proved that uh, if a subset of the first and positive integers avoids street and arithmetic progressions, then it uh, has zero density. Uh, he gave this quantitative bound, and uh, there was a long series of, uh, of improvements. And I believe uh, the, the latest result is due to Bloom and Sisask, uh, who proved uh, re recently that uh, n over log n uh, to one plus some positive epsilon is, uh, is also an after bound. Uh, studying uh, the, the integer variant, uh, is equivalent with uh, studying the problem in uh, uh, a cyclic group. Uh, of course, instead of the cyclic group, uh, the pro problem of bounding street or arithmetic progression free uh, sets, bounding the size of street or arithmetic progression free sets, uh, uh, can be formulated in, in any abelian group. Uh, so let's say that if G is an abelian group, then I R3 of G is the size of the largest subset of the group G, which do not contain, uh, which doesn't contain any three term uh, non constant arithmetic progression. Uh, so let's get back, get back to uh, the case of F3 to the N. Uh, it is already non trivial that uh, R3 F3 to the N is, uh, is little low uh, of the size of the group. Uh, then Meshulam gave the first quantitative bound by proving that uh, 3 to the n divided by n is, uh, is also an upper bound. Uh, here in this result, what we have is uh, the size of the group divided by the logarithm of the size of, of, of the group. If we go back here, uh, it is not included, but n over log n uh, is the uh, analogous result here. And uh, the analog of uh, the Bloom CSASC result um, is uh, the result of Bateman and Katz uh, from 2012, who proved that here uh, in the exponent of n, we can write number which is slightly larger than, than one. Um, so, so these were the, the best uh, upper bounds before um, this. Uh, this, this result that, that I will talk about, but let me also mention the, the lower bounds. If uh, we look at the one dimensional case, then if you pick any two elements, then of course uh, they form a set which uh, doesn't contain street or arithmetic progression. But then uh, with the help of the product construction, we can bubble this up. Uh, so this gives a lower bound on R3, F3 to the N, namely, uh, by taking the direct product of this set with itself and times, uh, we get a lower bound uh, of two to the n. But this means that uh, if we can come up with any construction in any, any dimension, then it gives uh, an asymptotic uh, lower bound as well. Uh, looking at the first few exact, exact values, we see that from the two dimensional case, we still get the same lower bound, but in the three dimensional case, there is already an improvement um, since the exact answer is larger than eight. Uh, so here the asymptotic lower bound is, uh, is already better than two to the n. The four dimensional case corresponds to the uh, card game set that you might know. It improves uh, on the bound again, uh, but uh, the exact answer is known only up to the six dimensional case. Um, 
it is uh, difficult to de determine the exact uh, Ramsey numbers. And uh, this problem is somewhat similar in the sense that uh, it, it is uh, not a su surprise that uh, finding the, the exact value uh, in a certain dimension is, uh, is getting uh, extremely difficult uh, very quickly. Uh, so although uh, if we were be able to, uh, to determine the exact values, say in dimension 100, then that would give better and better bounds that would converge uh, to the exact uh, value. Uh, this, uh, this cannot be done. But still, the best uh, lower bound is, uh, is not the one which comes from the six dimensional exact value. Uh, later, Kaderbank and Fishburn came up with, with a construction in some very large dimension, and the, the current record is due to Adel, who uh, found a large cap in uh, dimension uh, 480. Uh, of course, it's uh, not known whether this construction there is, is optimal or not, but it's a construction, so it, uh, it gives this 2.217 uh, to the n uh, lower bound. Uh, so here, uh, these were about the group F3 to the n. If we take a, in place of F3 and uh, a group of, uh, of even size, uh, then uh, the problem uh, will be somewhat different. If we take F5 or F7, then uh, it will turn out that uh, there is no big, big difference, but uh, the, the even order case uh, is somewhat different, but uh, we shouldn't take F2 to the n because uh, in F2 to the end, there is no uh, non-trivial street arithmetic progression at all. Uh, so in, in the even case, the uh, smallest uh, choice is, uh, is Z4 uh, to the n. Here, Lev gave a mesh ramp type bound. And uh, there was also an improvement, uh, like the improvement of Bateman and Katz for F3 to the n. Uh, here, it was uh, proved by, by standards. And uh, the improvement is smaller uh, because the epsilon is uh, not in the exponent of n. Uh, the additional factor is just log n uh, to the epsilon. In terms of lower bounds, here we can also uh, try to determine the, the exact values. Uh, with uh, S-watts, we could do this up to dimension 5. Uh, but uh, here, the best uh, lower bound construction is, uh, is not from a uh, product construction, uh, but uh, it is uh, obtained uh, in, in a different way that I will talk more about uh, later. Anyway, uh, it uh, is clear that there was a big gap between uh, the lower bounds. Uh, it was uh, was not clear uh, whether the, the answer is exponentially smaller uh, than the size of the group, so there is uh, an exponential saving or it is, uh, it is not the case, and uh, the upper bounds uh, are the ones that are, are close to the exact result. Uh, with uh, Kroot and Lev, we uh, studied the uh, case of Z4 to the n, and uh, the following uh, lemma turned out to be the uh, key tool in, uh, in getting an exponential saving. Uh, I just uh, briefly show it, but uh, I will give the proof with, um, with a different reformulation. Uh, so the our original lemma uh, was the following. If uh, there is an n-variable polynomial over F2 with a certain degree d, and A is a subset of F2 to the, to the n, which satisfies that uh, P vanishes uh, on uh, any sum where we add up two different uh, elements from the set A. Uh, so let's assume that this is the case. And then if uh, we also know that A is uh, somewhat large, uh, its size is larger than the sum of the binomial coefficients uh, up to n choose d over 2, uh, then we can conclude uh, that P also vanishes at 0. Uh, here, if we plug in A equals B, uh, then, uh, then we get uh, 0. Uh, this case was was excluded uh, in the condition, but if we claim that if uh, if a is uh, is large enough, then uh, p must also vanish at zero. Uh, 
uh, but here uh, if we think of uh, the degree as uh, some constant times n where the constant is strictly less than one uh, then uh, this bound is uh, exponentially smaller than uh, than two to the n uh, so it's it's not uh, extremely large uh, we can think about uh, this implication in the, in the following way uh, let's create a matrix m index where the rows and the columns are indexed by the the elements of a and uh, at the intersection of row x and column y we put uh, px plus y uh, then it can be proved that uh, if uh, p has a small degree in some sense then uh, the matrix has more rank but then if uh, p doesn't vanish at zero then uh, m is just a diagonal mat matrix because the of diagonal entries are zeros because of the condition and uh, if uh, p doesn't vanish at zero then the, the diagonal entries are uh, different from zero in fact they are all equal to one uh, so in this case uh, the rank of m is small uh, the rank of m uh, is, uh, is equal to the size of A, uh, since we have a diagonal matrix in which all the diagonal entries are, uh, are non-zero elements. But these two together mean that uh, if uh, A is large enough, uh, then from the condition, it, it must follow that uh, A uh, vanishes at zero. With the help of this lemma, uh, we could prove a result uh, with an exponential saving uh, in case of Z4 to the N, and uh, after less than a week, uh, Ellenberg and Geisfeit uh, managed to adopt uh, the method to the uh, setting of, of F3 to the N as well. Uh, so in both cases, uh, there, is an ex uh, there is an exponential saving. Uh, and in fact, uh, this implies that uh, if you take uh, Zm with M being uh, at least three, uh, then there is also an exponential saving. So there is a slight difference between the odd and the uh, and even cases, uh, but uh, uh, proving it for uh, values different from three and four uh, can be can be done uh, in the same way. Uh, so the original proof uh, used uh, this lemma in the setting of F three to the n. Uh, there is a clear, clear reformulation of uh, of uh, of this lemma. Uh, then, but uh, the problem the the method has two. Uh, other formulations. Uh, one reformulation can be given uh, with the help of uh, group rings. Uh, this was uh, given by, by Petrov. And the third formulation is uh, with the help of the so called uh, slice rank. Um, this uh, was given by, by Tao. And depending on the actual problem, uh, uh, you can find that one formulation is, uh, uh, is better to use than, than the other one. Uh, here I will uh, choose uh, the, the symmetric formulation given by, by Tao, which is uh, now called the, the slice rank method. Uh, this is uh, definitely the one which is the easiest to explain and uh, easiest to apply when it is uh, applicable uh, in an easy way. Uh, so, so let's continue with the, the slice rank method. So first, uh, we will define the uh, slice rank of, uh, of tensors, which will be different from the, the usual tensor rank. Let's assume that the S1, S2, SK are finite sets. Uh, they don't need to be the same set. And uh, F uh, is a field. It can be finite or infinite. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Then to define rank, uh, but what we can do is to define the rank one functions. Uh, first, uh, the rank one functions will be called slices in this case. And we say that uh, such an F is a slice if we can express it uh, as a product of two functions, uh, F and G, where F depends only on, uh, on one variable. It can be X1, S2, XK. And uh, G depends on, only on the other k minus one variables. So these are the slices, the rank one functions. Uh, and then the slice rank of an arbitrary F is the 
smallest t uh, such that we can express f as a sum of uh, of these slices. Um, so this minimum exists because it was assumed that the SI sets are finite. Uh, so if S1, S2, SK are all finite sets, then the slice rank is, uh, is well defined. Uh, for instance, if we take this uh, poloni uh, polynomial P, uh, then uh, it can be noticed that its slice rank is at most uh, two because we can express it as a sum of two slices. Uh, in the first slice, x depends only on x, and uh, the other factor depends on y and z. In the second slice, y squared depends only on y, and uh, the other term uh, depends on, uh, on x and z. Uh, it wouldn't be difficult to, to check that uh, the slice rank of this polynomial is exactly 2, uh, so it's not possible to, uh, to write this polynomial as uh, just one slice. Then Another special case, for instance, x plus y plus z, here the slice rank uh, is at most three because uh, we can take this decomposition into the sum of three slices. Uh, one depends only on, say, y, and x depends on, on x and z. And similarly, the two other expressions are, are also slices, but uh, of course we can do better uh, because one times y plus z is also a slice. One depends only on x, and y plus z depends only on, on y and z. Uh, so the slice rank of x plus y plus z uh, happens to be, be zero as well. Now let's see how to use the slice rank method to uh, give uh, an exponentially small bound in case of the, the cap set problem. Um, the, we will take the direct product of, of three sets uh, each of them will be a copy of fq to the n. Uh, here we could take q to be 3, but if we take q to be any other uh, odd prime power, then the proof is exactly the same. Uh, there is no difference at all. Uh, so let's form it in this more general way. And uh, the field with which we work is, uh, is fq. And f will be the characteristic function of uh, three term arithmetic progressions. Uh, so if we uh, pick an arithmetic progression x, y, z, then uh, f should be equal to one. Otherwise, it should be zero. Uh, I use the, this Kronecker delta notion uh, to, to denote this. And uh, this uh, f can be expressed as a polynomial uh, like this. Since uh, if we take an arithmetic progression, then in each uh, n, each uh, entry, we see that uh, the sum of xi and zi should be the same as uh, 2yi. Uh, so we, it, we subtract uh, 0 from 1, and the product of 1 is indeed the 1. Uh, however, if uh, x, y, and z uh, do not form an arithmetic progression in, in this order, uh, then uh, for some i, uh, this expression here uh, will be different from zero. And if we raise a non-zero power to the q uh, non-zero value to the q minus first uh, power, then we get a one. Uh, so there will be a zero among the n factors, and uh, and we get a zero. Uh, specifically, if we plug in uh, the same number three times. Uh, it is also counted uh, as an arithmetic progression. Now, if we take a subset of FQ to the N, which avoids non-trivial arithmetic progressions, uh, then we claim the following. Uh, first of all, we claim that the size of the set is the same as the slice rank of F restricted uh, to A times A times A. Uh, this restricted version of f is, uh, is a diagonal tensor. Uh, it is everywhere zero except the diagonal where we have uh, a, 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 so the same, uh, same element uh, three times. In, <clears throat> in the two-dimensional case with the usual rank of, of matrices, it's perfectly clear that uh, the rank of uh, a diagonal matrix uh, is uh, 
equal to the number of non-zero elements on the main diagonal. And um, lemma, one, lemma one, one says that uh, the same also holds uh, in, in higher dimensions uh, for, for the slice rank. Uh, so it can be shown that uh, the slice rank of a diagonal uh, hypermatrix is, uh, is also the number of non-zero entries on the diagonal. Uh, this is not uh, straightforward at all, but uh, with the of an inductive uh, proof playing with the orthogonality, uh, it, it, it can be, be justified. Uh, so now we know that uh, to bound the size of A, it suffices to bound the slice strength of F restricted uh, to the, the product A times A times A. But uh, it is clearly uh, at most the, the slice strength of F uh, without being restricted at all. Uh, so the, this inequality is, uh, is clear. And then uh, finally, we, we bound the slice rank of F and uh, with the help of the following observation, uh, a bound, which is exponentially smaller than Q to the N uh, can be, be given. Uh, so let's take a look at, uh, at F. It is a product of uh, N uh, factors. Each factor has degree Q minus one. Uh, Let's expand the brackets, then there will be a uh, lot of uh, terms. Uh, each term is a product of certain uh, C's, Y's, and Z's. Uh, but let's take a look at the total degree uh, in the X, the total degree in the Y's, and uh, the total degree in, in the Z's. Uh, uh, one of these three uh, must be at most uh, the third of the degree of f. The degree of f is n times q minus one uh, divided by three. Uh, and what we are doing is, is the following. We list uh, all the uh, polynomials of, uh, monomials of uh, x1, x2, xn, uh, where the total degree is at most uh, n times q minus one divided by three. And uh, for each of them, we collect uh, the sum of the monomials, monomials with, with y's and c's with the, with the coefficients uh, that we need. Uh, this way, uh, we will get uh, this number of, of slices. Uh, so the number of those n tuples of non-negative integers where the integers are between zero and Q minus one. And uh, the sum of them is at most uh, n times Q minus one divided by three. We uh, haven't obtained yet uh, all, the, all the monomials from F because it can happen that uh, in, a, in, a, a moni, in, a, in a monomial, it is uh, not uh, the total degree of X, uh, X of the axis, which is at most uh, n times q minus one over three. Uh, but then we collect those uh, at uh, the, the monomials uh, of the form y1 to the beta one, y2 to the beta two, y n to the beta n, uh, in which the, uh, some of the beta exponents is uh, at most the degree divided by three. If, uh, if uh, in case of a term, the degree in the x is, is small enough and the degree uh, in the in y's is also small enough, then we uh, this means that we have already uh, included those terms uh, at the axis, so we do not include them again, uh, only only the remaining ones, and then we repeat the same with uh, the uh, with those mon monomials of z1, z2, zn, where the total degree is at most uh, the degree of f divided by three. Uh, so this way we decompose this polynomial f into the uh, sum of uh, three times the size of this set many slices. And uh, if we take uh, an, an n-tuple uh, in uh, 0, 1, q minus 1 to the n uh, randomly, then uh, the sum of the alpha, the expected value of the sum of the alpha exponents is uh, 
n times q minus one divided by only two. Uh, so this is below the expected value. And with some probability theory, it is immediate that uh, this means that uh, the, the number of those n tuples uh, is, is exponentially smaller uh, than the, the total number of, uh, of n tuples, which is q to the n. Uh, so this provides an exponential improvement. As, as another example, um, I, I, I sketched a proof uh, for, uh, for binding the signs of uh, sunflower free three sets. I believe uh, uh, most of you are, are familiar with, uh, with sunflowers, but do, for, for those who are not, here is a, a picture. Uh, so a sunflower uh, looks like this, and uh, the definition of it uh, is uh, that a K sunflower is a collection of K sets uh, such that the intersection of any two sets uh, from the collection is the same. Uh, these are also called data systems. Um, we, we look at the case of uh, three sunflowers. Uh, so here the three sets A, B, and C form a three sunflower. There is a part which is included in, uh, in all of them. And if we take out this, uh, this common part, then the remaining parts of A, B, and C are disjoint. Uh, so this is a three sunflower that uh, I will call shortly just sunflower uh, from now. Erdős and Samaridi uh, conjectured uh, that uh, if we take a K sunflower free uh, family of subsets of an N element set, uh, then uh, the number of sets uh, must be exponentially smaller than uh, two to the n, which is the total number of subsets of, of one to n. Uh, Alon Spielke and Dumans uh, in 2013 uh, proved that uh, if there is an exponential saving in case of the cap set problem, uh, so if uh, R3 of F3 to the n happens to be uh, exponentially smaller than 3 to the n, then uh, for three sunflowers, uh, there is also an exponential saving. And uh, if we plug in the bound 2.756 uh, into their argument, then it gives uh, the bound uh, 1.94 to the end in case of the uh, sunflower free problem. Uh, so in some sense, uh, when the Kerset result was proved, it already implied uh, that uh, the Adiosemeridi sunflower conjecture holds uh, for three sunflowers. Uh, however, it is possible to, to get a better bound. If instead of using the result as a black box, uh, we, we use the method itself. Uh, this was uh, proved by Nasrund and, and Savin after the uh, blog post of Tao uh, about the, the slice rank uh, method. Uh, so this gives a better bound. And uh, more recently, uh, Nasrund uh, further improved on this bound uh, using, uh, using again the method. I, I will sketch the proof of, uh, of this uh, middle uh, uh, middle uh, bound. Uh, so let's take uh, a sunflower free family. Uh, we can think of it as uh, zero one vectors uh, that are the characteristic vectors of the sets appearing in F. Uh, and uh, we define uh, E, the direct product of uh, three copies of zero one to the n uh, by, by this polynomial. So the product of two minus the sum of x i by plus y i plus z i. And uh, the field with which we work can be the field of, of the reals, for instance. Uh, so they, we would like this uh, function to be, be diagonal if we have a sunflower free uh, family. Uh, which, uh, which in fact was, so if, uh, let's go back here. So here, if you have a sunflower like this, then those elements are contained in, in three of the sets. Those elements are contained in one. And if something is outside, then it is not contained in any. So 
the, they can appear in zero, one, or, or three uh, of the sets. Uh, so it's uh, from this, it almost follows that uh, this is a, a diagonal uh, tensor, but uh, there is a minor problem. If uh, two of the sets, B and C, are the same, and uh, the third set is uh, uh, is a set which contains B and C, uh, then uh, the condition fails to hold. But we can avoid this situation if uh, we restrict ourselves to uh, sets having the same Hamming weight. Uh, so let's say that S contains those sets that have Hamming weight L, uh, so we, the sets with uh, the, the vectors with L vans, then if we restrict T to the direct product of SL, SL, and SL, then it indeed holds that, uh, that T is non-zero if and only if, uh, if X, Y, and Z are all the same. So we can repeat uh, the, the previous proof uh, because of uh, the lemma which says that the rank of a diagonal hypermatrix, the slice rank of a diagonal hypermatrix is uh, the number of non-zero entries uh, along the main diagonal. We can uh, say that uh, the size of SL is exactly uh, the slice rank of T restricted to the direct product of, uh, of SL, SL, and SL. Then we get uh, an upper bound if we are able to bound the slice rank of, of T. Uh, T is again a nice polynomial, uh, the product of n linear polynomials. It has a uh, total degree n. And here again, we can uh, partition the monomials into slices uh, in the way that we look at the total degree in the x's, the total degree in the y's, and the total degree in the z's. And we collect uh, everything at uh, the one which has the smallest uh, degree. And if the total degree is n, then one of the three degrees will be at most n over three. Uh, this gives uh, this bound, uh, which can be calculated and, and gives back this uh, 1.89 uh, to the power of n. And uh, it's it might seem to be important. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's important that uh, in here, uh, to be able to say that uh, the size of the set that uh, we would like to bound uh, is the same as the slice rank, we needed the trivial sunflowers, uh, but the three sets are the same. In case of the uh, sets avoiding street arithmetic progressions, we needed the constant street arithmetic progressions uh, to be able to say uh, that the size of the set is, uh, is the same as the slice rank. And then after this, it indeed, uh, it's, it's indeed enough to bound uh, uh, the slice rank. Uh, in, in most of the applications, uh, this is what is happening. So the, the tensors that are used uh, are diagonal, uh, but, uh, but not in all of the applications. So uh, there, there is uh, another application where the, the tensor which is used is, is non-diagonal. Uh, let me continue with a, a few words about uh, the resulting Adler bounds. Uh, so for a, if Q is an odd prime, then uh, for R3 FQ to the N, we get this bound. So we need to count uh, those n tuples of, of integers. Uh, for the first few values, this can be done. The method also works if uh, Q is not a prime but the proper prime power. But uh, in fact, it's better not to use uh, the method in those cases. Uh, we can also think of, uh, re of f9 to the n um, as a vector space over s3 of dimension 2. Case of f3, then uh, we get uh, a better uh, bound. Uh, so although the method is applicable for proper, proper prime powers as well, uh, it's better uh, not to use it uh, because, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the problem for proper prime powers uh, is the same as the problem for primes. 
uh, for instance, alpha three is, is this number, but probably this is not that uh, enlightening. Uh, alpha Q in general can be given as the minimum of this function, uh, which uh, is always strictly less than Q. Uh, if we look at the problem in ZM to the N, then uh, there are some immediate consequences. Uh, in fact, uh, it follows immediately that uh, for every M larger than two, uh, R3 of uh, ZM to the N is exponentially small. I, illustrate the argument uh, on Z15 to the N. Uh, inside Z15 to the N, we have a subgroup isomorphic to F3 to the N. Uh, in each of the five to the N cosets of, uh, of F3 to the N, we can apply the cap set bound. Uh, so for R3, Z15 to the N, we get the bound five to the N times uh, R3 of F3 to the N. And since uh, there is an exponential saving for F3, there is also an exponential saving for, for Z15. Uh, so this is immediate that uh, all these are exponentially small. If uh, M is a, a prime power like nine, then uh, by this is the trivial uh, implication, uh, applying the bound in each of the cosets of uh, the subgroup F3 to the N. But uh, if uh, we use the method, uh, then uh, the resulting bound can be improved uh, for every odd prime power. And uh, here again, there is a uh, there is a slight difference with in the even case. Uh, there, it is more difficult to to prove that uh, one can do better than the, the trivial implication. Uh, but in case of uh, Z8 to the n, uh, this improvement uh, was indeed done by Petrov and Pohata. And uh, that improvement would go on also for 1632, just uh, it's, uh, it's getting more and more complicated. Uh, so for time powers, uh, the trivial implication can be improved. Uh, here, uh, we looked at odd numbers and numbers that are divisible by four, uh, but we haven't looked at the case when M has residue two mod four. And uh, the reason behind this is that uh, this is the same as the odd case. Uh, it can be uh, easily noticed that, uh, for instance, R3 of Z6 to the N is exactly uh, 2 to the N times R3 of Z3 to the N. Uh, so the case when M is even, but not divisible by 4, just uh, gives back the, the odd case. Uh, so, so that's why we, we do not uh, consider those cases. Um, it would be interesting to improve uh, on, on the bounds, uh, even for m equals three or four, uh, the gap uh, is quite large in, in all of the cases. And uh, it would be even more interesting uh, to, to decide whether uh, four AP, P3 subsets uh, are also exponentially so small or not. Uh, here, nothing is known with uh, one tiny exception. Uh, for Z6 to the N, uh, it can be shown that even R6, Z6 to the N uh, is exponentially small. But uh, this is uh, just uh, because of the structure of, uh, of Z6 to the N. Uh, so for, for one slide, uh, let, because there is case, uh, so here, the main question about the limit of the nth root of R6, Z6 to the n uh, is, of course, whether it's 6 or something smaller than 6. Uh, but before uh, answering this, uh, I would like to mention that, in fact, uh, I don't know whether this limit exists or not. Uh, why? Uh, because if uh, we take m to be a prime or, or a prime power, then uh, constructions can be obtained with the help of the product construction. And if uh, the product construction shown works, uh, then uh, it is not difficult to prove that uh, the nth root of this quantity has to converge. Also, if uh, we deal with the uh, three term arithmetic progression presets and M is arbitrary, then it can also be checked that the product construction works. Uh, so the nth root of the quantity converges. Uh, 
if the length of the arithmetic progression which should be uh, avoided is six uh, and uh, m is uh, is not a prime power then the product construction doesn't work uh, so it's it's not clear whether this limit exists of not or not of course uh, it surely exists because such a quantity shouldn't oscillate uh, but uh, we were not able to prove uh, the existence of the limit uh, but uh, it, it can be proved that uh, the limb soup uh, is strictly less than six uh, in with with points we proved that uh, in two dimensions the answer is 25 uh, which is a square of five but uh, it is not mm, with the help of the product construction if we take the direct product of uh, the one dimensional construction with itself then it will contain uh, six term arithmetic progressions uh, and in three dimensions the answer is already smaller than the third power of of five uh, so it's not even possible to, to um, modify the definition of uh, the product uh, in such a way that this new product construction works uh, the the exact answer is, is smaller than the third power of five and what we proved is uh, are, are the following two bounds uh, numerically the best bound is uh, is 5.709 to the n. And uh, there is an also bound which uses uh, the, the cap set uh, value. Uh, so theoretically, it can happen if, uh, so if here we plug in the currently known best bound for R3 of Z3 to the n, uh, then we get something worse than this constant. But if the cap set bound gets improved, then Theoretically, it could happen that this second bound will, will be better than uh, 5.7. Uh, but once again, uh, to get these results, uh, one should just look at the structures of Z6 to the N. The problem reduces to being able to say something about the following. If we take multiple subsets of uh, F3 to the N, uh, 2 to the N subsets, such that the same arithmetic progression is not contained in at least two of these subsets and we are able to bound the total size of the subsets then we can bound r6 of z6 to the n uh, which also means that if we have a super saturation result in f3 to the n uh, then this exponential saving can be done for z6 to the n and uh, a super saturation result uh, can be can be obtained in in uh, in r in F3 to the N. From the other side, for R6, Z6 to the N, we, we have only the, the lower bound. Uh, of course, this implies that if M is divisible by six, then we still have this exponential saving, but uh, all that is known is that uh, the quantity is exponentially small if uh, K is uh, three and M is at least three, also exponentially small if M is divisible by six and K is at most six, uh, but uh, there is no other known case, and uh, interestingly, uh, there is no case in which uh, it is known uh, that uh, the quantity would be uh, not exponentially small. Uh, so it would be very interesting to, to add anything uh, to, to either here or, or there. Uh, let's get back uh, to the case of, uh, of uh, street arithmetic progression resets uh, in Z4 to the N. Uh, with s faults, we, we proved uh, the bound of this form. Uh, so here the lower bound is the maximum of a certain sum uh, where we have these binary coefficients and uh, the and uh, this c i i minus t denotes the largest possible size of your code in f2 uh, to the i with the minimum distance at least uh, i minus t uh, so in in the lower bound we have these uh, largest possible sizes of codes with certain minimum distances uh, added up with certain binomial coefficients and we choose the optimal t uh, to get the, the best lower bound up to dimension five uh, this gives back uh, the the optimal value uh, in dimension six, we 
if we're not able to find the exact value. Uh, so in all the cases where the exact value is known, uh, this, uh, this bound happens to be tight, and the growth rate uh, of it is uh, 3 to the n divided by, by root of n. Uh, the best choice for t is around uh, two thirds times n, uh, where already the, the sum of the two ter first two terms uh, is uh, something like this. Uh, so for R3, z4 to the n, uh, the, the best uh, known lower bound is 3 to the n divided by, by root of n. Uh, here the problem. Uh, can be reformulated to a problem about uh, subsets of F2 to the n uh, in the following way. Uh, so let's uh, look at the following problem. Uh, what is the largest possible total size of uh, subsets AX of uh, F2 to the n, where the sets are indexed also by the, the elements of F2 to the n, such that a certain condition holds? for the system of subsets. Uh, whenever y is contained in x plus c, x plus c, x, then uh, a, y should be empty. Uh, here, a, x plus c, x is the restricted sum of a, x and a, x. Uh, so a, a, x plus c, x uh, contains uh, the sums uh, a plus b, where a and b are two different elements taken from a, x, and we add to all of these sums uh, x. Uh, so this is the condition. If ax is, is not empty, then uh, for every y contained in x plus a, x plus a, x, uh, a y should be empty. And uh, it can be checked that the exact answer for this uh, problem is, is r3 uh, of z4 to the n. Uh, so to bound r3 of z4 to the n, um, when it suffices to bound the total size of, uh, of these subsets. Uh, in fact, uh, this is what is happening in, in our original paper uh, with, with Crute and Lev as well. Uh, just uh, it is not uh, stated there that uh, explicitly. Uh, and uh, in the small cases, uh, in the extremal constructions, uh, all the non-empty subsets uh, turn out to be subspaces. Uh, which heuristically seems to be a good idea to, uh, to try to use uh, subspaces because subspaces have a small doubling. If AX is a subspace, then AX plus AX uh, still have the same size. If uh, AX is not a subspace or even very far from being a subspace, then uh, in most of the cases, the, the, the sum set is, is much larger. And if it's larger, then uh, we get more empty sets. Uh, and in the special case, when all the non-empty subsets are subspaces, uh, which we cannot prove to be optimal, uh, to be the optimal choice, but uh, in this case, which, which heuristically seems to be close to the optimal choice, uh, we could prove that the total size is at most three to the n. So in, in this subscase, uh, the exact uh, bound uh, constant would be three, uh, and motivated by this, we, we conjecture that uh, it might be the case that uh, for for the four to the n, the, the exact constant is is three. Mm, here, uh, Peter, uh, construction. Uh, yes, you are running out of time. Oh, okay, okay. Then I just uh, so I should. Uh, yeah, just right wrap, wrap it up. Uh, okay, okay, so uh, I, I think I, I, I can finish here. Um, so this is essentially the, the last side. Uh, so to, to get a lower bound, uh, first one has to decide about uh, those sets to which we assign the empty set. Uh, and uh, then for those elements to which we are trying to assign a non-empty set, uh, we need to find the largest subset such that x plus a, x plus a, x contained in the union of, uh, of those vectors to which the empty set is assigned uh, plus x. And if uh, z uh, is chosen to be a ball, uh, 
then uh, the best choice uh, for the subsets uh, is a code supported uh, on, on the support of the vector uh, having a certain minimum distance. Uh, but what we could not prove is that uh, the best choice uh, for the set is, is indeed a ball. But if you take it to be a ball of the optimal size, uh, then we get uh, this uh, resulting upper bound, which gives uh, the bounds 3 to the n divided by, by root of n. And uh, in fact, one can also think about this bound as the uh, spanner capacity of, uh, of a weighted graph in which we have two just two vertices, directed edge between them. One of the two vertices have weight two, and the other have weight one. Uh, so, so this question might have connections uh, with the with the spanner capacity of uh, of graphs. Okay, and I, I stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter. Nice talk. So, uh, any question for Peter? I can ask a question. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yes. So I was wondering. So you said the bound for R six of Z six to the n. So do, so does this not generalize to other um three times something like fifteen, like R fifteen of Z fifteen to the n, or is there something special about six? Uh, so it's special about six uh, that uh, trig can be used for multiples of six. Uh, so. If m is divisible by six and the length of the arithmetic progression is uh, at most six, uh, then uh, an exponential saving is, is obtained. Uh, otherwise, uh, it is not obtained. Uh, so except the case of z6 to the n, uh, to get an exponential improvement, uh, one has to do it for a, a prime or for a prime power. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, any other question for Peter? Uh, okay, so now let's thank Peter again. Thank you for a nice talk. Thank you.